Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagan Radian here at the Surface Navy Association's annual conference and trade show in Northern Virginia, number one gathering of U.S. Navy surface warfare leaders from around the world, as well as Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard leadership here to discuss uh, the future of all surface uh, force related issues. We're partnered with the Surface Navy Association in coverage of this show, which is sponsored for us by Huntington Ingalls Industries, General Electric Marine, L3 Technologies, and Leonardo DRS, and we're here on the Lockheed Martin stand uh, again to talk to Joe uh, DiPietro, who is the Vice President and General Manager uh, for Small uh, Surface Combatants and, and Systems here at uh, Lockheed Martin. Joe, fi I'm glad we finally managed to connect. Yes, great to see you. Um, so let's talk a little bit, I mean, obviously getting uh, the littoral combat ship out for its first uh, deployment or regular deployment schedule starts this year, as we heard from the Navy leadership from Admiral Brown and, and uh, Rear Admiral Boxall. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how you guys are supporting that goal. I know that the entire LCS uh, enterprise from uh, the Navy side, from the operational side, on the Surf Force side, as well as uh, you and, and Finn Contier, your partner on, on the Freedom class, as well as the folks on the Independence class are all working on this together. And actually a lot of lessons learned and everything going back among, among and between everybody. Talk to us a little bit about how you guys are supporting that and to get this into regularized service. As somebody who has scars to bear on the Navy, FC side on the civilian side as, as one of the, the technical folks uh, certainly uh, on, on the requirement as it was going through development. Yeah, so the, one of the big things is, is, you know, we do have the luxury of having not only the two deployments on Freedom, but the deployment on Fort Worth, which was 23 months long. So there's a lot of lessons learned from those activities. As far as the ships uh, shifting to Mayport, one of the big things, too, is we brought online the integrated tactical trainer with the Navy. So getting those crews ready and making sure that we have rigorous training to support their deployment. Uh, and then just the ship uh, from a uh, status perspective. So we're supporting the Navy. The Navy has a lead on it. But obviously, we came out of our post-shakedown availability, all of our our combat system ship qualification testing to validate the systems and the performance and now we're supporting the Navy as they go through their maintenance avail and getting that ship ready for deployment. And uh, what sort of timeline are you guys uh, working against? Is there a magic date out there that you're uh, working toward? I mean, we, we've I've, I've covered the program for a while uh, and I remember Admiral Harvey being like, hey, we're we're ripping off the Band-Aid, we're going to get them underway. You know, that, that was a while ago, and, and uh, you know, we did manage to get to Sembawang, but then, um, you know, things have been sporadic in terms of the program. You know, is, the, what's, what's, is, there, a, is there a date specific you guys are shooting for? Uh, so, right now, uh, we're just, we're supporting the Navy as far as getting the ship uh, out here in 2019. I don't have a specific date from the Navy. I think the biggest thing that we're, we've been working on in supporting that battle rhythm of it is what we've been achieving. So, last year, we trial three ships, we delivered two ships, uh, and we're really focused on getting through all the qualification testing as well as our post shakedown availabilities. That's where we roll in and kind of complete what we call the SCN period, the new construction period of the ship, getting that ship complete, ready with all the things that we need to have for the Navy. Uh, so that is the drumbeat that we're on. We did that on five and seven. We're currently doing that on nine and 11. Uh, and then we look forward to getting 13 and we're on track to deliver 15 here in uh, early February to the Navy. So getting that battle rhythm is key to getting them the ships that they can deploy. Um, when, uh, as you look at the lessons learned, you talked about the recent deployments, one of them very lengthy, 22 okay. months. Um, talk to us about some of those lessons learned and also the lessons learned on the build cycle. Uh, because Admiral Brown sort of said, hey look, really the program starts at LCS 5. Um, you know, we have to consider one, two, three, four to be all development developmental ships for the independence class and the freedom class. W work us through all of the lessons that you're getting on the construction side of things and on the operational side of things as you continue to refine the design and refine what you're delivering and refine the plan going forward because you know, maintenance, the logistics structure has been a key delaying function to this to a degree, which is the reason why the whole the freedom halls in Mayport and, and uh, independence in San Diego got, got formed up. So there's definitely been an evolution of the program. So you go from LCS-1 to LCS-3, and you already see things that are, the ship got a little bit longer. We integrated some of the systems that were not previously on the ship. Then we moved to LCS-5. That's really the production representative baseline for the ship. So the block by, which incorporates all of the LCS-1 and 3 changes, as well as some changes that were specified by the government. We rolled those into LCS-5. At the same time, we're getting feedback from the deployment of LCS-3. And some of the feedback that we got were things like, we'd like to be able to stow the rib permanently on the ramp, even in speeds up to 40 knots. So we have a redesigned ramp now that we install on those ships. We do that as a post-delivery change, but then on, on LCS-21, that's an inline change. So they come with that ramp. 
We also have on LCS 17 and follow, we'll go into a solid state version of our radar, not only for an, uh, improved performance, but just as you're going through obsolescence and part management so that we can make sure that we've got all the parts we need for LCS 1 through 15 while we're going ahead and fielding 17 and follow and then work with the Navy on any upgrade plans there. Uh, we go to CRAM. Uh, as part of that, and we're also going to the seven meter rib. So while the requirement was to have the five meter rib from a rescue perspective, if you didn't have the SUW mission package with those 11 meter ribs on, having a seven meter rib gives them a little bit more flexibility. So we're rolling that right into the inline design as well as working that as part of our backfit plan. So we've got those lessons learned, the feedback from those operators and sailors that were out there on that ship, on that deployment, uh, and we're trying to incorporate that in both in line and then working with the Navy as they prepare the ships for deployments. Um, in, in, can you give us a little bit of an update on the mission module outlook? You know, we've seen um, all sorts of movement on that. Uh, we know that Expeditionary Warfare uh, uh, last late last year disaggregated the mission, the mine countermeasures mission, for example, from the ships, right? Originally, they were supposed to replace the mine hunter. Yeah. Walk us through what's happening with all the mission modules, because again, one of the most attractive features of the ship was this modular approach you can bring to it to fit it with a mine uh, package, or an anti-submarine package, or uh, an anti-surface warfare package. So, you know, we have products that are on some of the mission modules, like the Longbow Hellfire missile, but, you know, PMS 420, as well as some of their uh, direct support, uh, is the integrator of the mission package. So what we focus on is actually the design of the ship. So what we've been doing now is, is we've been getting shapes, as well as uh, uh, portions of the package, bringing them up to the yard and validating the work. And the big part that we do is validate the comms between the ship's computing environment and the mission package computing environment. So being able to validate that when that comes on board, it's going to talk and integrate very quickly to the ship. We did a demonstration in Port Wanimi to prove that we could swap out a mission package in less than four days, which was part of the requirement. Uh, so we've really been, is the ship ready to receive it? Do we have interferences? We're bringing shapes up for different vehicles, unmanned and manned that exist and don't exist yet today. Make sure everything fits to the requirements of this interface control document. And then we've also been heavily involved, obviously, in the SUW mission package testing. Just did the SSMM, was able to employ the Longbow Hellfire and integrate the systems across the ship to be able to schedule, do you use a 57 millimeter gun? When do you use the 30 millimeter? When do you use the Longbow Hellfire? With that integration experience we have, plus the luxury of having the common source library because of our Aegis-based combat system on there. Um, obviously a big win, and of course you didn't mention the Naval Strike Missile, right, which is being integrated on the ships as well. Yeah, so we're currently working on the design, and we do have a model here that shows some of the, some of the work that we've been doing to date on that. Uh, that is kind of the first phase of what I'll call lethality and survivability or warfighting enhancements to the LCS, and obviously the Naval Strike Missile brings a capability that exceeds what we've had in the past from a surface-to-surface -surface missile perspective. Uh, and, and very nicely done. You got two H60s on the on the on the deck. Just uh, just noticed that. Uh, well 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 done. And the thirty up on the on the deck house. Um, let's talk about the frigate requirement. Um, obviously, uh, you're working with your Fincantieri partner. Uh, five teams in it uh, right now. Just a reprise for uh, our our viewers. You guys with a Freedom variant that you're working with Fincantieri. The Austal guys have uh, their variant, the frigate variant of the Independence. Uh, Huntington Ingalls has been very, very quiet. Uh, full disclosure, they're our sponsor, but they're very, very quiet. Fincantieri is bidding a, an anti-submarine version of, of its FREM, which is in Italian. Uh, that's a Franco-Italian uh, program. And, and of course, you've got General Dynamics uh, uh, Bath Ironworks teamed with uh, Spain's uh, Navanti on, on bringing a variant of the F-100 here. So, um, with, with all of that said, uh, you guys have been working very, very, uh, you know, for, for a very long time on a whole variety of uh, LCSs, uh, which at some point could be regarded as a frigate variant. Talk to us about the requirement, uh, the final version of that requirement is going to be out uh, in, in, in just a couple of months here as the Navy works for a down select decision uh, next year. It's a two-part question. Part one of the question is, are, are you satisfied? Is the requirement clear enough in terms of understanding what the Navy wants from you guys? And from your standpoint, what are the merits that you guys are bringing to this? Because it's a very, very unusual competition. You know, in a sense, you could say that there's only one of uh, the ships, really. The, the Frem is the only one that was like an optimized ASW ship. On the other hand, you know, the Navy has a very, very freewheeling, uh, open competition on, on, on this thing at the end of the day. And depending on who you talk to, any one of the known proposals seems to you know have merit in the eyes of Navy leadership yeah. so uh, I think I think the big part is is that the Navy has been working with the requirements they are looking for a multi-mission ship 
So, um, you know, we had in the past where we've had better capability on some ships, FFG-7 and ASW maybe, than they had in air warfare. And there was a limitation for employing those ships. So I think the Navy is truly looking for a multi-mission surface combatant as part of this. What they've done is, is in this concept design phase, which we're going to be working on through June, uh, is gone through a set of requirements, offered the opportunity for all the industry teams to provide cost reduction candidates that allow us to look at the specification. And then now we're on what we're calling uh, iteration design two, which is now kind of locked those requirements down to go ahead and deliver formal products to the Navy. That will be the concept design of our ship. Uh, we're hopeful that as we close on this gap here that we're going to get the final resolution on those cost reduction candidates so that we can lock that baseline and understand that capability as we move forward. I think from a perspective of what we bring to the table, not only do we have the history of the littoral combat ship, but we actually are involved in over seven nations on over 120 ships in ship design and integration of complex combat systems. So, you know, even on cruisers and destroyers, we designed topside design, all the arrangement of the spaces on those ships in order to support the combat system is done by a TDP from Lockheed Martin that goes to Huntington Ingalls and to Bath Ironworks to build that ship. So I think given the Navy specifying the equipment, and our understanding of those design requirements from an integration perspective to get the best performance, to deal with things like fracture side, to integrate different EMI and EMC capabilities across the board to mitigate those EMI and EMC capabilities. We bring that to bear as part of our experience, not only on LCS, but like I said, we can talk about Congo class, KDX, Canadian surface combatant, LCS, and our DDGs and destroyers. So. And, and in, in fairness to everybody, right? I mean, the Finn Kateri guys have multi-mission frigates as well. Yes. I mean, they they have ASW capability on them. And and if you look at you know what what everybody's trying to do is trying to bring that sort of a overall package. I mean, you, I know the Navanti guys pride themselves on multi-mission ships uh, as well. Um, you guys had the Saudi Arabia uh, win, which was very important. Barry McCullough almost became an honorary Saudi citizen. He was spending so much time there. <laughs> Shout out to Admiral McCullough, outstanding uh, Surface Navy Associate, outgoing Surface Navy Association president, and uh, Rick Hunt, former. Uh, um, uh, Surf 4, uh, who's over at uh, FinCon here, is going to make a great president going, uh, going forward. Um, talk to us a little bit about the international competitive environment and where you guys see opportunities. That deal took a long time uh, to do. I mean, we, we, we saw it born in one administration, mature in another, and finally get signed in a, in a third. Um, well, work us through what the international global picture is. You guys have been on a run. Canada was a big win. Australia also was a big win. And partnership with BAE Systems, obviously, on, a, on the Type 26 uh, ship, um, which at, at some point folks were saying, hey, you know, at Brits, you know, they're never going to get it. They're very proud of that win. What does that outlook internationally look for you guys? Uh, well, obviously, we want to we want to build from what we've done with the multi-mission surface combat, and it shows the flexibility of the Littoral Combat Ship, especially as we move away from the mission package and get into the fixed systems. There's a lot of space. The Littoral Combat Ship is about 40% empty to support the mission package and has the weight to support that, so we can reconfigure that for the multi-mission uh, domain. I think the big part that we're looking at in the international landscape, though, is, is um, you know, what capability do they have from a ship construction perspective? Do they want to build it in country? Is there a partnership that they're looking for with the United States? And then, of course, commonality and interoperability. Again, with the systems that, that we're targeting as part of whether it comes from our portfolio or from what we do with the United States Navy, looking at that ability to show a, a picture that's going to integrate them with their U.S. forces as well as with their own forces that they have today. So understanding their fleet to make sure that they're going to have a capability with the assets that they have. We see interest, uh, that Corvette frigate size market does have a lot of interest across the board. It's understanding those requirements with them and then understanding those in-country capabilities so we can partner with folks around the globe. And we also look at that with our partner Fink Cantieri as we look at our, our relationship and how we can expand that moving forward. And uh, uh, one uh, final question. As you tweak the frigate design, I, I wanted to ask you that. Yeah, um, and I think I've discussed this uh, last year with Steve O'Brien, uh, who was with you guys for very many years, but now he's over at uh, L3, um, that you're going with inline shafts, right, uh, in terms of uh, the propulsion train. Just walk us through a thumbnail sketch of how the frigate variant is different from the LCS variant, because at this point there are multiple LCS variants in terms of various different fits and capabilities. So, you know, sometimes people look at your model and then they look at the ship and they look at the model and they're like, you know, trying, everybody's trying to do LCSology. So walk us through about a little bit about how fundamentally uh, different in some ways your frigate is from what the standard LCS, Mark 1 Mod 0 LCS, not that there is a Mark 1 Mod 0 LCS. 
see us, but anyway. Well, obviously, you know, the uh, the biggest thing that we've shared is what the requirements are driving through, more of a uh, CPP-based system with screws uh, and uh, independent shaft lines in order to support the requirements that have been laid out for us. So that that's probably one of the larger changes, along with the lengthening ship, in order to be able to support the equipment that goes on there, the crew complement, et cetera, have been the more dynamic changes that we've integrated into the ship design. Again, we understand a lot of the systems that have been called out, Mark 41 VLS, C-WIP, et cetera, that we've either our Lockheed Martin products or we have worked on an integration of our Aegis fleet. So we've been able to incorporate those in and, and understand what we need to do from our top side design perspective. And uh, you used to be somebody who was on the technical requirements side of things. Uh, naval vessel rules was something that you spilled some blood uh, over and probably have some uh, deep, both emotional and physical <laughs> scars over. I'm just kidding. But, um, uh, you know, Admiral Boxall uh, has been very clear that you know, the program is also to reinvent how the Navy does business in a sense, and that old regs, old rules shouldn't stop something smart from uh, happening. No blame on NAPSI, but sometimes the Navy goes with what it knows, tried and true, and doesn't want to deviate very much from that. Uh, do you see that kind of flexibility? I've asked this of each of the guys uh, who are competing for this, that hey, if there's a novel new way of doing things, that there's going to be some flexibility in that system to get the novel new in that'll help increase availability, help supportability, help increase underway time, even though it may be somewhat, if not very different from the way the Navy has historically done things. I think the biggest thing is is uh, we've been working on decomposing the spec, so I think the spec has the right level of information to allow some freedom for the designers and shipbuilders to look at different opportunities to look at that spec, and we're always also looking at the commonality piece. Obviously, a big f driver's got to be that training, that, that fleet com compliance uh, discussion and how they're going to be able to have the infrastructure to support the parts, et cetera. So we're looking at that and saying, okay, what 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 is business as usual, and then what are these new these new ways to do those capabilities that are affordable? Maybe bring more capability to the dance in order to meet that requirement. So we're trying to balance that in order to be able to present something that says the the risk is balanced for it, it's affordable, and it's here to meet your requirements. Joe D. Pietro, Vice President and General Manager of Small Surface Combatants and uh, Systems over here at the Lockheed Martin Corporation of America. Sir, thanks very, very much. Really appreciate it. Best of luck on the program. Thank you. Thank you very much.